and welcome back to Scarred for Life, the podcast where we open up old wounds by looking back at the films that scared us as kids. I'm Terry. And I'm Mary Beth. In each episode, our special guest brings with them a movie that traumatized them as a child. This week, our guest is writer, director, and editor Paul Owens. His feature directorial debut, Landlocked, is currently available at select theaters and on VOD. Welcome to the show! Hey, that was nice. Thanks for that intro. <laughs> I'm good. You're welcome! <laughs> Uh, thanks for joining us. We're, uh, uh-huh. boy, we're really excited to talk both about your film and then the movie you brought with you today. So let's, let's start with, with your, uh, with Landlocked. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about this film? Oh God, deja vu. Jeez, I don't know. Why. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a movie. Oh God. I, I made, uh, it's it a seems. movie. <laughs> <laughs> it's a movie. Uh, it's a movie I made. It stars my family, my brothers, my dad, my mom, and, The concept was we kind of adapted our old family home videos into sort of like a time travel, horror, sci-fi story. And so the main character is my brother, Mason. He kind of plays himself. We all kind of play ourselves like in the present day. But he kind of comes back to the family home, which is going to be torn down. And he finds like an old VHS camera that can see into the past and record things. And he kind of becomes obsessed with documenting the past and... Uh, he kind of becomes ensnared in the memories and things get spooky and there's all sorts of good stuff. It's good. It's a good movie. It's um, really good. Uh, so how did, how did you go about constructing this? Cause you said you used it from, you made it from, uh, from old home movies. How did, how mm-hmm. did you come up with this concept and how did you incorporate all of that and get, get everything together? That sounds like a monumental task. I know when I was starting to do it, I was like, why am I doing this? God, this is so much work. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Um, like one day and I was like, shit. And then eight years later, I'm like still talking about this stuff and doing it basically. But anyway, um, <laughs> I guess the origins was I came home uh, after a couple years away from home. Like, things had definitely changed. Like, my parents had gotten divorced. Like, my older brother was out of the house at that point. Things were different. And definitely a weird feeling, weird time in my life. And similar to the character in the movie, I'm just sort of, like, aimlessly wandering around, going through things, trying to sort of reconnect with the past. And I found like an old box of home movies and watching them, I was struck by just how much things had changed. And I didn't really feel a connection to these, to these people in the video anymore. And it was just so weird watching that, you know, seeing like my living room in the video where we're all Mm. happy family talking, being together and then cut to present day. I'm watching the house is falling apart. No one's around and seemed like there was a movie there. And then we did it. Yeah. <laughs> so how how many years did it did this movie take to make? Ooh, I mean, at least ten. At least ten. Jeez. Um, the script I was writing it in earnest in 2012. I know that 2014 wow. we started shooting it. 2018 we got the last little bits. Um, then it was in pre production, and then once quarantine rolled around, I was like, I should probably finish this thing because it's becoming a little embarrassing that it's just sitting around now, and. So, and then that's kind of why we're here. I just, I finished it up, got it out and coming out tomorrow. Yeah. Hell yeah. yeah. Crazy. And what was your experience like? I know I asked you this question in our other interview, but just pretend I didn't. <laughs> no, didn't. Um, uh, what was your experience like working with your, with almost exclusively your family on this movie? I, it was amazing. I mean, it was super emotional. It was just I don't know. It, it was satisfying to get these things out of the out in the open and really like mm. dissect them, talk about them, be like, "You felt that way. I felt that way too." It's you know, there were, there's a lot of takes that ended with us in tears. You know, just like mm. it was a lot of emotions. And um, you know, I was telling, I was just saying, it was like some takes ended with us laughing as well, like just at really inappropriate times when like people were dying on screen, just like <laughs> couldn't stop laughing, that kind of thing. And it was cathartic i think actually and yeah i feel like now looking back on whenever i see anyone i'm like we're talking about the movie and it's just like it it is a weirdly fond experience like that we all kind of shared together so it is emotional and i am getting teary-eyed again thinking about it like in the last interview um when i was watching it uh with an audience for the first time in a theater like in the back of the theater i was watching the whole thing 
and just seeing like my brothers and family up there like acting <clears throat> like being amazing and like making something beautiful out of this like just idea i had was like damn this is got me got me misty eyed for sure it was that's so cool it's been an intense ride so yeah just all this week i've just been thinking about it and just like damn get like gotta like, do this wait wait these tears because it's just like feels really weird to like put this personable thing out and like have it be um something people review is really weird like give it a star rating is like really strange to be like your family's four out of five stars <laughs> Or this was it. Your, your authentic family experience that you are trying to capture <laughs> is getting a star rating. That is such a weird yeah, experience. So You're weird. like, wait, like my whole movies are getting like rated yeah. by by yeah. critics. It's I didn't even think about how strange of an experience that must be. Yeah, I hate to tell you, Dad, but you only got three stars this time. You know. <laughs> So oh. the other reason I was really excited to chat with you is when I was looking at your IMDb page, um, oh. I saw Double Fine Adventure. And oh. as someone that was a Kickstart, I kicked or it wasn't even Kickstarter. What, what pla- I can't even remember what platform they use. But yeah, it was Kickstarter. I, you, you was it way. Kickstarter? I couldn't yeah. remember if it was that or if they had shifted because they went to some other one for Psychonauts too. And I, so I can't, mm-hmm. I couldn't remember. But yeah, I was at a Kickstarter member of that and I oh, watched shit. that series the entire oh. time. And to see that on your resume, it was like this, what? Holy <laughs> shit. No one has ever brought up those two things like during landlock <laughs> interviews. No one's mentioned that like at all and vice versa. So that's crazy. I mean, I, I have to because I was like, I love, first of all, I love Double Fine. I love uh, Tim Schafer. I love all of the stuff they do. Shit. And so when I saw that on there, I was like, fuck yeah, I get to nerd out a little bit. What was that like film, filming that for, gosh, it was like three years in <sighs> period, wasn't it? Talk three about years. long commitments. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. You ain't seen nothing yet, man. Um, <laughs> there's another one coming. There's another one coming. Ooh. It was amazing. I mean, everyone there is a genius and they're super smart, super funny. It's just like sometimes I don't know what I did what I did to like be able to just be in the presence of such brilliant people and to be able to like ask them questions and pick their brains and see how they work and you know, it's not exactly filmmaking, you know, I can't learn as much if if I was working on like a film, but they you know, I feel like I learned a lot about life just being around these people that had, you know, Pretty, pretty br- brilliant, brilliant folk for sure. Um, yeah, and I mean that company had had so many ups and downs before they got to that that point, and it's just like to see that. And that was, I think, was so cool watching that as like a fan of of Tim Schafer and what they do was seeing the warts and all the ups and downs of of making. Okay, we just got money from Kickstarter. How are we going to do it? And so I just, yeah. I just wanted to say that that was so cool to see that that you were involved in that. Wow, I'm so flattered. That's awesome. Thank you so Terry much. Terry texted me last backing. night. He's like, I can't wait to ask him about this. <laughs> and I was like, Yeah, <laughs> he's so. You're not supposed to tell anyone I'm a video game nerd. Okay, this is I'm a horror guy. All right, <laughs> yeah. just keep it to yourself. <laughs> we'll cut. Okay, cut. well, so you did cut. say. <laughs> That you're a horror guy. So let's go back to the very beginning. How did you get introduced to horror? Jeez Louise. Um, I was thinking about this and trying to dredge up these old memories. God, it's just like some of this stuff I haven't thought about in years and years. And some of it is kind of a revelation to be like, shit, that was like the start, wasn't it? It kind of echoes through your life in a way. Like uh, Night of the Living Dead was definitely the first one I remember being like, okay, "Okay, this is the first thing I'm, the earliest one that I can remember. And we had an old VHS of it. I don't even know how or why we had it because we weren't really a horror family. And uh, now I think it had something to do with the copyright, probably. I'm assuming the weird copyright made it be like it was a dollar in some bin somewhere and someone picked probably. it up and it ended up in our spot. So maybe when I was like three or four, I was like super young, but we had the tape. Oh, wow. Wow. And I remember just like it took multiple times to watch the whole thing because like put it in and maybe get to the part where the first zombie shows up and then be like, stop, I, I can't watch this. It's too scary. It's too scary. <laughs> and then maybe a week later, it's like, okay, one more shot. And I make it up to like when she gets into the house, maybe. And, oh, wow. And maybe it took like five times to make it to the end. And oh wow. obviously the ending was something else. Yeah, um, yeah. But I feel like I still pull from that movie a lot. And the, uh, just it was shot in Pennsylvania and I was in Jersey and I grew up in like an old farmhouse and it takes place in an old farmhouse and there was just a lot of like things that brought it close to home where I was like shit this could happen in my backyard it could could be happening right now um and so I think that's why I kind of 
flipped out for that one, and it's still sort of part of my vocabulary working um, today. You said you were like four or five when you saw that? God, I must have been. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, three or four. Wow, really what an indelible memory. I can't, <laughs> I can't imagine seeing that at that young age. It's scary. It's a scary movie. It is, yeah. <laughs> So did that did that like increase your love of horror or did you go seek it out after that or did it scare you yeah. kind of away from it? I was kind of mentioning in the last interview, it was more just like the iconography was everywhere. Like just Freddy was always like in the mm. early 90s, like Freddy and Jason were just like always there. Like the Freddy TV show. I remember like watching that. Like that was a little easier to get news. to. Freddy's name. There you go. Yeah, I love that show. <laughs> I don't As a kid, I've not seen it since then. Yeah. <laughs> So I remember them and I remember like a kid dressing up as Freddy for Halloween in kindergarten and him getting in a lot of trouble for that. Um, <laughs> like getting sent to the principal for dressing as Freddy for Halloween. Oh my God. So those were the early ones, just like the iconography. I, I didn't even, I never even saw the movies until way later. And there were a couple things that stuck out. Like um, you guys are big alien people, right? In your family? Oh, oh yeah. Okay. Oh, Terry, cool, especially, cool. Terry especially is the alien okay, freak. Okay, okay, uh -huh. okay. Nice. Um, I do remember flipping around on the TV and seeing, I came on the scene where um, Parker and Lambert get killed, that bit, mm -hmm. and that was like the most terrifying thing I'd ever seen at that point. That was maybe like five or something, but that was just... Good God. <laughs> I still have the memory of, of, of that, like the corridor of seeing, like, it's not even how it was in the actual movie, I realized, but I have this other memory that is just still strong after how many years? 30 years? Longer? 35? I, so you said you were like five when you saw that or that like that's that clip that bit <laughs> that one Jesus bit. I wow. I was eight when my parents sat me down to watch this movie and I, I've told the story Jesus. when when we covered it but like I got to the the uh the dinner scene and I had no idea what was gonna happen and when it burst out of this chest I was like okay I'm done this is too much for my little brain okay I didn't see that part I only saw the xenomorph killing these two but that was I mean, that would be terrifying enough that was, that's, that's a scary movie did the trick. Especially at that age. Yeah, so that that's sort of like a memory I can't get out. Yeah. Oh, so I was going to say, because you saw that you like, write a lot of horror iconography and you saw some horror movies, but, you know, now that you're making horror movies, was there a moment in your head, maybe as you got older, that clicked that was like, I really like horror, I want to, like, actively seek it out and make horror movies? No, I was just, just saying, God, I don't know why. Um, it, uh, I wasn't that, I, I loved horror, but it wasn't like the genre I was looking to make films in it just sort of happened that way and it, it seemed like oh here's the story uh, and but it, it would come out scary and come out like spooky and like weird and yeah so it wasn't by choice at all and yeah it's only been after i've started to make these movies that i've been like i should watch more of these things um so yeah i'm still like trying to figure it out really so, so have you seen any movies recently that like really spoke to you horror movies in particular yeah. I mean, it sounds really basic. I was trying to think about this last night, like, which really obscure, obscure one have I seen recently to really try to impress people? But um, <laughs> I feel you like Hereditary was mm. the big one recently, which I feel like is not original at all. But like, I got to go be honest and say that was that one really freaked me out in a way that I hadn't really felt in a really long time. So, it comes up on the podcast an awful lot. It, oh yeah? It's it's a great choice. Thank it's you. terrifying. <laughs> choice it's really scary i watched it yeah. recently it's still really fucking scary no matter how many times i've seen it, it still fucking scares Sheesh. me i don't want to watch it again like to be honest like i do and i don't but um killing of a sacred deer comes in mind as well just because uh, that was oh, like oh, i guess yeah. i wish i could make something like this like i wish i'd made this movie it's so good um that really scared me too yeah those are kind of the more recent ones the witch it follows other really obvious choices i feel like but great do you have any subgenres that you really feel that you gravitate more towards within the horror within the horror space? God, I mean anything with like just that sense of dread, you know, because it's yeah. it's like it's still a little bit of a mystery, even though it's kind of in my movies as well. Like why it's working on me? It's like why does this affect me so much? Like what are, what are these feelings that these movies are conjuring up in me, and how how are they doing this? And even when I do it, I'm like, how did I do that? Uh, <laughs> why does this work? You know, I still feel like I'm trying to figure it out in a way. Yeah. So cool. your your film um, incorporates a lot of found footage techniques. Are are you a fan of of the subgenre? Mary Beth's laughing because she's turned me into a found footage person through the course I also of asked the same question. He was Did like, you really? not until people like you were calling it found footage. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Did that sound mean when I said that? I didn't mean it that way. Absolutely not. I wear it as a badge of honor, honestly. If I I, I wear it as a badge of honor. <laughs> okay. 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 Um, yeah, not until people like you guys started <laughs> bringing it up. No, I, I was trying to make like a documentary narrative hybrid. I was like, this is going to be like a new kind of movie. No one's ever seen this before. And then, and then people are like, it's a found footage movie, right? It's like, yeah, I guess so. Um, okay, but let me get on my soapbox really, really fast, just for a brief second. You're not wrong. You are, you are, you are working with a new kind of found footage filmmaking technique that I think is going to become more popular. But you are at, I think, like the beginning of hybrid found footage and incorporating found footage elements into more traditional narrative horror filmmaking. And I think it's so cool to see more films do that. And I think. Your film was one of the first I actually saw doing that, like, months ago when we first saw it on the festival circuit. So I think what you were out to accomplish, you you actually did. And I think it is something that is still very fresh and new in the genre space. So, kudos. <laughs> well, thank you. I'm it's off my soapbox now. Very flattering. No, it's very flattering. <laughs> I appreciate it. Terry Are is you... so used to me doing this. <laughs> you said a lot of really nice things online. I'm going to... I didn't say this before, but, like, yeah, I definitely noticed... Because I was looking for all the nice stuff you said, and it's, it's all very kind. So I thank you oh. for that. So. You made a good movie. I mean, like, what can I say? What um, can you say? But before we get into the other good movie that we're talking about today, we are going to take a super quick break. And we're back <laughs> from the break. So, Paul, what movie have you brought with you today for us to discuss? Bram Stoker's... Dracula. Oh my god. Let me just, let us share a brief synopsis of this incredible film that <laughs> everyone who has heard this podcast and has heard me and Terry talk about it is probably very excited for us to be chatting about it today. But in Bram Stoker's Dracula, the centuries, the centuries old vampire Count Dracula comes to England to seduce his barrister Jonathan Hawker's fiance Mina Murray and inflict havoc in the foreign land. Dun, dun, dun. Wow, is that the plot? Dun. Okay. That's cool. according that's to IMDb. IMDb. That's IMDb. We don't write these It's our favorite ourselves. place to go. Um, it's kind Sometimes of a joke at this like... point because they're really bad as an office yeah. and they're it's even funnier, but yeah. Okay, so take us back. When? How did you first see this movie? I mean, you've talked cool. about seeing movies at three and four and five. So I'm, I'm curious, how old were you when you saw this? How did you see this? What was going through your mind this entire time? Give us, give us your horror story. I was, I must have been eight. I think it was third grade, which is, I I don't know if that's old or not. I'm not sure. Um, Especially nowadays. This is definitely like pre-internet era. So just to kind of like set the mood a little bit. But um, I was looking, I watched the making of and Coppola calls it a dark erotic nightmare. And that's definitely Mm. what the experience was. (laughs) For me watching this um so god damn how do i even start um so i wasn't third grade but i feel like it might have well have been preschool because i was kind of a sheltered kid and like super shy and like didn't have too many friends like definitely was way more comfortable like writing little stories in a notebook and then acting them out with my toys you know that kind of thing and Oh my god, Definitely Paul, that, that's my I'm childhood. That's hey, my childhood. Cool. I was read I read and wrote little stories too. Like I was hey. I was a nerd. We were all nerds. <laughs> there you go. And so I could definitely feel like in, in my third grade class that I was not as worldly as the other kids. I could definitely sense that they knew a lot more than me about a lot of stuff. Um and I wasn't really allowed to watch R-rated movies. I'm not sure. Is this, was this your also your guys' experience too? My parents were weird. Uh, like they originally, they let me watch a lot of stuff as long as I covered my eyes during what? nudity. <laughs> oh, okay. There you go. And then um, that they became more conservative over the like the course of my childhood, and then I was not allowed to watch them. So, oh, goodness. Yeah. My my mom was. My mom was tried to keep me from watching rated R movies just because she was a cure child. And the rules with my dad were very lax, which I will share more about my specific experience watching this movie with my dad at an incredibly young age. Um, but nudity and sex were definitely like go into the other room while this is happening kind of scenario in my right. family. But yeah, we were pretty. My mom tried to for a while, keep it on lock, but it didn't last very long. 
God, we're so aligned. This is scary. Okay. <laughs> and and yeah, my, my mom was like super like, she'd really flip out. And in fact, like she's definitely not, I'm not going to send her this podcast. Like, cause I'm not sending her this at all. Um, <laughs> she was like anti nudity to like a really insane degree where it was like, I remember her like flipping out about my brother seeing Carlito's way because it had nudity in it. Um, oh. Which I saw it years later. It's like barely anything. I was like, that? Come on. But back then it was like so serious. And like, if she found out I'd seen this movie, she would have taken my Super Nintendo away like so fast. And like, you know what I mean? So. Yeah. That's a travesty. That's a super. <laughs> <laughs> like, I think Dirty Dancing was maybe the most risque thing I'd seen at that point. Oh, my parents wouldn't let me watch Dirty Dancing because Whoa. it had Dirty Dancing in the title. <laughs> I was not allowed to watch that. Nice. Good one, all right. Um, actually, weird tangent. Like, how much? How many other kinds of movies do you guys watch? Are you just hard, or are you like, I watch everything? Oh, I watch everything. Oh, I, I watch, watch everything. everything. Oh, yeah. And, um, oh, yeah. I'm a big, my husband really loves, like, Japanese, uh, like, samurai movies. So we watch a lot of those. Mm. We're big, we're a big animation anime household as well. Yeah. I watch everything. <laughs> horror is the is the primary but it helps to have someone who isn't my husband loves horror but he's not as much so it's helpful to have him like get me out of out of watching only horror movies all the time i also (laughs) watch a lot of um horrific reality television okay i don't do that that is scary (laughs) Okay. <laughs> it is oh, yeah, no, I it's terrifying and it's like I, I understand it's not great but sometimes I just want to watch rich white women be mean to each other no no I get it no I really get it honestly <laughs> <laughs> no, I but, own my truth but... here <laughs> it's a safe space <laughs> yes I was um, saying this is a safe perv space for the night because I was lamenting the fact that I'm going to sound like a perv coming out of this and I really don't mean to be but oh no don't worry <laughs> don't know, worry it's just what a what a per it's public terrible um anyway so i was at a sleepover my sort of like my best friend at the time and he's like hey check it out look what i got and he was like okay okay Ooh, great at r okay um, all right like um when you're a kid you definitely don't want to act like you're afraid around your friends because mm-hmm. you'll never hear the end of it and maybe they'll be like beating you up next year like things change really fast when you're a kid you know so yeah yeah i definitely remember going off some bicycle jumps that i didn't really want to i was just like i can't be i can't be like i'm afraid around this stuff i gotta nearly kill myself anyway <laughs> so we're at the sleepover and i'm looking at the box and it's like coppola who i, I don't never heard of that guy before and but i knew like carpenter craven i knew like the hard movie guy so i was like this must be like one of those hard movie guys that like had their name above the title and like i'd seen their stuff and like at by that point it was a little like not not as scary like like uh that stuff like freddie was maybe getting a little goofy like by mm-hmm. that time like you know yeah. and so i was like okay this should be okay and then when it starts there's there was a different tone to it than i was used to like there was it felt like this was a movie made by adults for adults and they weren't thinking about kids. So right away there was like a weird, like unknowable terror kind of happening, like that I didn't really understand. And I was a little older at that point. So it was like, okay, this isn't too bad. It's not too bad. But the, we get to the Arabian nights bookshop. Oh, uh Um, and I, you know, like I said, pre-internet, we hadn't had like, the family life class in school or anything like we hadn't had anything like that and that was sort of surprising finding it finding it out that way <laughs> i feel like uh it should have been more like a diagram or a chart from wearing class or something um felt weird <laughs> seeing that moment at a slumber party and that is how you're finding out about sex is that isn't that weird because I, I mean you hear rumors you hear like you know, you kind of like, kind of know maybe what's going on, but like, basically it was like, okay, I'm going to do a thing. My hands right here where it's like, this is like the extent of, <laughs> and I don't even yeah. know what that means really. Like at that point, finger through the okay <laughs> sign listeners, finger yeah. through the okay sign. Exactly. Yeah. So I was, that's all I knew. And you're trying to pretend like you know more than that. <laughs> right. And, and the bad kids in school, they definitely, it seemed like they knew more what was up because maybe their dad had like 
a porno collection or, you know, or something. They had HBO, which we didn't have. Like, we basically had, like, the basic TV package. And, like I said, everything that came in was filtered heavily. Yep. So that was different. That was the different thing that was happening. Um, and I was like, holy shit. Um, and then, so in the back of my mind, I'm starting to sing like, okay, if my mom finds out I actually watched this movie, which like she's friends with my friend's mom, like they talk, it could easily be like, oh, what'd the kids do? And it's like, they watched a movie and she'd be like, what movie? And then she would be like, I don't know, Dracula or something. Cause she didn't care. But my mom would have been like, okay, he's going to be grounded and I'm going to whoop his ass. Like this is, this is what's going to happen. <laughs> So or Super Nintendo for Paul. <laughs> I love that Super Nintendo. You don't know. Oh, me too. So it's like in the back of my head, like this fear is growing, like even greater than the movie almost of like what my mom would do to me if she found out I was watching this movie. And I'm like, but so far it's just an illustration on a page. I could be like, oh, I didn't see that part. I must have been getting candy or something. <laughs> um, but it's in the bathroom. then... <laughs> But then the actual erotic nightmare started, um, where and the I mean basically the turning point was when Monica Bellucci came up out of the bed, um, which I'd never seen a naked woman before, which which was surprising. Oh boy! To oh get boy. to see where everything's at and all that <laughs> jazz. Um, <laughs> I just I can't. Like I just Lucci's cannot. So hot. And she is a great a start. Bunch, a bunch of third graders watching this movie. Like boy, young eighth grade, bo- not eighth grade, third grade boys watching this movie. <laughs> like the energy in that room must have been so bizarre. I can't even imagine. <laughs> Weird. It was like in the living room too. So part of me was like afraid that like his mom would come out and be like, "What? <laughs> um, What's going on out here, boys?" Yeah. Yeah. So. It was a lot at that point. Yeah, yeah. And that was okay, though. But the the worst one was when Wolf Dracula <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. is with uh, Lucy on the on the bench there in the garden was like, holy shit. And I actually, like, got up, hit stop. And I don't even know why I did this, because it's just so embarrassing that I would, like, care so much. But, like, I was just, I got up, turned the, the thing, hit stop, and, like, ran out of the room and and, like... <laughs> It's definitely one of those, you know, those memories you have where you think about them in bed at 4 a.m. and you're just like, oh, yeah. why did I do that? Mm-hmm. Um, this is like one of the one out of a thousand that I'll cycle through and on a given night and be like, why didn't I just like keep my cool and watch this movie? God damn. I mean, that's a lot. That's a lot to deal with. I could not imagine <laughs> seeing this movie as an eight year old. I saw this movie as an 11 year old. I think I was 11. Yeah. I was 11. I saw. So my parents were my parents were divorced. My dad was the horror parent. I would go to his house on the weekends. We'd watch horror movies and like rules didn't matter at his house. Like, you know, the typical divorce kid narrative. And so he used me to basically watch the movies that he like rewatch movies he wanted to watch without kind of maybe thinking that maybe an 11 year old <clears throat> shouldn't be watching Bram Stoker's Dracula. Um, <laughs> I believe I was 11. I was super, I was really young because at the point where Monica Bellucci's beautiful naked body came out from the bed and they start having like their weird orgy situation. My step, my dad made me cover. He-, he sat next to me and covered my eyes, and oh. all I could hear were the noises. <laughs> and I kid you not, I was like, "Is that what sex sounds like?" <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> and, and I it was is. just like, "It, it is." Um, it's Monica Bellucci licking your nipple for just fifteen <laughs> minutes straight, I and honestly, it's gushing blood. Oh my god. But that was the moment that my I, they covered my eyes, and for the longest time, I hadn't I didn't watch this movie again. I didn't know what happened. I had no idea. And I when I watched it, I, I, years later, I was like, "Yeah, I guess they probably shouldn't have seen." That was one of those rare instances where I was like, "Yeah, you know what? I probably shouldn't have been allowed to see that." That and this the sex scene in American Psycho that I shouldn't have seen at a young age that my parents Jesus, literally oh, wow. made me leave the room. Well, <laughs> I was like, I probably shouldn't be watching American Psycho like in high school wow. um, with my whole family. Um, but anyway, that's a story for another time. But yeah, werewolf. And But I don't remember him having the same reaction to the werewolf fucking, though. Like, I don't remember my dad. Ha- I, I don't have that memory of my dad doing that. I do remember my dad's 
girlfriend at the time was going to be his second wife was like, Mark, I don't think we should be showing this to her. <laughs> yeah, Mark. Okay. <laughs> and he was like, it's fine. And I was like, I don't think this is fine. Like, I'm all about, like, letting your kids watch stuff, but this one's a lot. Like, this is a lot. Like, this movie is an erotic nightmare. I guess at the werewolf and Mina scene is just absolutely, like... He's having an orgasm there on screen, which, like, to a kid, that makes no sense at all. It's like, what's... Why is he making that face? <laughs> what's, what's he doing? Also, it's like the first time you've ever seen sex on screen is an orgy with vampire women and then a wolf, like, having sex with a woman who is asleep in a garden and is, or like... I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna ask. But wow, that must have been very formative for your sexual awakening as a child. <laughs> Sorry, not to get. They didn't make up till a few years later. Is the thing. That's a problem. <laughs> they didn't make up till later. I was. They were still asleep. Slumbering. <laughs> Slumbering. So you you turn it off and then you you flood the room. Is that? Yeah, and to my friend's credit, he came and coaxed me back in and he he didn't hold it against me at all he wasn't like you know didn't beat me up the next year we were still cool but so did you finish the movie yeah yeah i think i did god yeah i don't remember beyond that point really that's kind of the part that my memory sort of gets a little hazy i think yeah. so i honestly can't remember i think i was just like out of body at that point wow um yeah that's that's basically it though yeah so did your your mom never found out i take it to this day, I mean, that's why I definitely don't want her to hear this. So no one sent it to her for sure. She's gonna take away your. She's gonna take away your Super Nintendo now, <laughs> retroactively. Yeah, I get. She could. She could. I mean, she got way more lax with my younger brother though. Like by the time she had her fourth child, it was like whatever, anything goes, you know. Yeah, it's always. I know like how that, that goes. So Are you the oldest? Uh, second. Second oldest. Second. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. yes. Wait, so Terry, when was the first time you saw this movie? Well, so the first time I saw this movie was last year, Mary Beth, when I got bullied into oh, watching right. it. I did bully you oh. into watching it. I, my brain's you and, broken. and one of our listeners bullied me into watching this movie finally. And I and didn't know what sex was yet. I didn't know what sex didn't. was. My my <laughs> sexual didn't. awakening was the werewolf fucking. Last I, year. Yeah. So last bizarre. Year. <laughs> 41 years old, finally learning what that's all about. No. Okay. I have a very weird relationship with this movie because for two reasons. One, my knowledge of this story comes from the Bram Stoker's Dracula Sega CD video game. Ooh. No, I had the Super Nintendo one. I had the Super Nintendo one. Oh my God. It's crazy you bring that up. I forgot. I so the that. Sega CD version has clips from this movie that are so compressed Wow. So pixelated and so out of order, but like it starts with with Dracula throwing his sword at the at the cross, and then the gushing blood and him drinking, and then all of a sudden you're Harker and you are punching bats and kicking rats and jumping over weird things on the ground. I don't know if they're giant bear traps or what, but there are these things on the ground that you're jumping over, and you eventually start punching spiders. And you fight Dracula, who's throwing fireballs at you. Um, at one point, you do fight Lucy in her wedding dress glory, and you kick her head off. <laughs> nice. And there's all these little clips from Side the movie. Side note, there was definitely a very brief joking moment that I was like, I should have my wedding dress be like Lucy's. <laughs> Mary Beth, that would have been amazing. <laughs> that would have been so funny. Wait, with the collar that comes out, that one? Oh, yeah. Oh, fuck okay. yeah. I got married on Halloween, so it, was, it would have been perfect. Oh. But it was just maybe, it doesn't quite my taste. Not quite my style. <laughs> but it was like this really bad beat em up game that obviously they spent so much money on the licensing of it that they just like, I don't know, throw some bats in here and just have Harker punch them. It didn't it even look like week. Keanu. Yeah, it was not a good game, but it did have some cool atmosphere. I'm going to say that about it. Like it had a cool like, kind of like soundscape going mm -hmm. on and like so it had like a weirdly ahead of its time like tone to the whole thing that was spooky but the gameplay itself was kind of kind of whatever but i had that game too that's crazy but the thing is is that my parent my dad would not let me watch this movie i was when it, it came out in 92 it probably got it on vhs sometime late 92 or 93 so i would have been somewhere between 11 and 12 when it came out and i remember i have this vivid memory of because we were in Alaska and 
when at this point I was, I had like a little loft. We had like, they had a two bedroom house that had a loft and then my brother came along and he got the room. And so I was living in the loft and I remember nighttime, my dad was watching this movie downstairs. And so whenever there was a movie that I was not allowed to watch, I would sometimes try to crawl and like sneak around and look down the, 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 cause like they had like a, what is that? A banister, like a, mm. a railing. And so I could like peek down and I remember peeking down and seeing the only scene I saw was the or the orgy scene. Oh my and what, I, is, what is with us, y'all? Why is it like the orgy scene the only one we saw? And I remember seeing this going, what is happening? And then my dad happened to look up at that time. I don't oh know if God. I gasped or what. He's like, go to your bed. I and mean, that so, is a, like, <laughs> you do start to look around when you're watching this movie a little bit. Like there's a lot of moaning where I'm just like, are my neighbors hearing this? I should. <laughs> Seriously. turn this down there's a lot of like looking around when you're watching this movie sometimes. like i feel like i'm watching it's like i feel like you're watching porn sometimes like a lot of this movie yeah. is very pornographic it's dirty it's dirty in the best way <laughs> yeah, oh my God. so like that is literally for years the only thing i knew about this movie was the keanu reeves sex scene that my dad said go to your bed <laughs> and playing the sega cd game in which you were punching and kicking bats like that exactly how Francis time. Ford Coppola wanted you to experience and know this incredible film. God, uh-huh. I want to shoot Coppola playing the game and just see what he thinks of it. Just be like, here, just just try this, see see how this plays. I just, just want to see this eight year old guy try. Do you remember? Do you remember the scene where where Harker punches a bat? <laughs> <laughs> You wrote that in your movie, right? Like the bu- you took the book and inter- and you know you added that in there for artistic flair of of Jonathan Harker played by Keanu Reeves <laughs> punching bats in this dilapidated castle. Dracula uh, throwing fireballs it sounds mm-hmm. right up his alley. Like, it sounds like they tried to make Castlevania, but then not make Castlevania. Yeah, kind of, kind of. Oh, yeah, I fucking love Castlevania. Anyway. Um, really good. Okay, but have you either of you read Dracula? Oh yeah, I was gonna do it for this podcast and then i was like didn't didn't do it <laughs> didn't, didn't, didn't actually you do it. that's okay um okay. Uh, if you want to hear more soapbox uh me talking about how dracula is the first is a first example of found footage is an epistolary novel and epistolary novels are literary forms of found footage because they're letters written back and wow. forth Wow. Um, it all comes back to found footage <laughs> for me <laughs> specifically. And um, Graham didn't even realize it. He was like, "Okay, sure." <laughs> he's like, "Sure." This, this this weirdo in the, in a, in a couple hundred years will just talk crazily about my book. It's fine. <laughs> um, but okay, so upset. I, the book obviously this is very much more sexual movie than the book, but we have uh, this is like a. Loyal, not really, kind of, not actually, adaptation of the of of the book. Not really. I would say that it hits a lot of the narrative beats that yeah. uh, the original Dracula didn't really like the nineteen thirty two Dracula. Like, yeah, I would say, I would say that it, it, in some ways it is it is very faithful, minus the the whole romance story. Yeah, and the it's werewolf definite- fucking. It definitely keeps a lot more of like these intricacies of of like the relationships between. Nina and um and Jonathan and then we also have like the Renfield stuff and then Lucy suitors a lot of characters obviously but um I think let's just starting from the beginning I think the opening to this movie is one of the most beautiful and disgusting openings of a film I've ever seen absolutely obsessed with the opening sequence where they are explaining Dracula as a like who he who he was historically and then showing his, the armor that I feel like we all kind of know and love about from Dracula that looks like the muscles from the incredible, oh my god, I totally forgot her name, the costume designer. So while you're looking that up, that was actually my other memory of this movie. And it was because in college, I was taking a class, I, I don't remember what it was, but I think it was like, I think it was a philosophy class. And we were talking about this this scene and like metaphor in it with the colors and stuff. And so I did see... The opening scene with the muscle red armor and the cross and everything. I did see that in college. And that was probably the only, aside from the 20 seconds I saw of the orgy, the only thing I had seen yeah. until last year. But um, Aiko Ishioka uh, is the costume desi- was the costume designer. She recently passed away, sadly. But 
all of the costume design work in this film is absolutely impeccable. Like Gary, I, I will talk about Gary Oldman and his beautiful outfits forever. But I think what it ha- what, between her design with the armor that looks like the human mus- like muscular system. And the colors and the symbol, and like, you know, we have the symbolism, we have him stabbing the cross and the blood coming out of it. Like, everything about it evokes, to me, eroticism, though, because he has, like, he shares this really passionate kiss with his Elizabeth, which, mm. ooh, Elizabeth. <laughs> um, sorry, I told you, I told you I was going to be a handful this episode. Like, I warned everyone. But. You did. And it, you can just feel that energy already. It's kind of a little bit grimy, a little bit gross, but like sensual. And I think that from the get go, this movie really sets that tone in a, in a really, in a way that I didn't notice until I watched this super recently, actually. So my best friend and his wife just had a baby and they said, Hey, we want to show Griffin, our newborn, Bram Stoker's Dracula, do you want to be here? Because you're the horror queen. Do you want to be here for his first Bram Stoker's Dracula experience? And I'm also, sorry. It, it was his wife's first time seeing it too, but they were joking and framing it as Griffin's first time seeing it. Oh, okay. Movie. Good, good, good. Um, <laughs> but we, and we, we also got oysters because, like, Aphrod- we, we were joking because, like, aphrodisiacs, and we were just, like, it was a whole bit. It was so oh funny. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it was ridiculous and then two other friends of ours came had never seen it and i was like guys i'm not i'm not joking when i tell you that this is the horniest movie horror movie you'll ever (laughs) see and um so that after the beginning with a group of people who have seen it and not seen it and a newborn baby they were like oh okay we see what you're talking about and then the movie begins and it was it's and the score too. Oh, like, that's I what just... I wanted to say. The the opening to this with the the score by and I do not know how to pronounce this this man's name. What Wo- Wojciech Kilar? Who? Yes. This. Vo- yeah, I know. Who, I know what you're talking. <laughs> it's it's so sumptuous. It's so erotic. It's so Ooh. gothic. It's so sexy. It's so dark and mysterious. It is. When when that music comes on, it's like, oh, I am in for I am in for something operatic, something horrifying, and something incredibly erotic, and that is what we get with this movie. And I think from there, you know, we get introduced to our lovers, who you know, we have they're they're very like timid. They've never actually really kissed before. Um, we have Winona Ryder as our as our Mina, and we have a uh, Keanu Reeves with his questionable accent as Jonathan. I was oh, marveling Keanu. at the word Earth. He's like, Earth? Like, the way he says Earth, like, really threw me. And he says it, like, twice. And it's really <laughs> weird both times. Okay, the, the, there are two <laughs> moments in this that, I, that just grab my attention every time I watch this movie. Because I've, I've seen this now, I think, three times since I first saw it last year. <laughs> and the first one is this clip. I have a clip teed up for it. We can be married when I return. We can be married when I return. <laughs> married. <laughs> Can I just say, I feel like it does work for the story, though, watching it last night, because he's a little bit of a goon in the early moments of the movie, and it kind of works for the story, like, because he kind of becomes like a badass with the gray hair by the end, but, like, there's a look that Winona gives him when he says that, where she's like, uh, just shut up and kiss me, kind of look on, on her face, and I'm like, it's, it's almost like they acknowledge that he's kind of a goon, and that he's pretty, but he's kind of like yeah. a goofball. So yeah. I feel like weirdly it really works for me anyway. Like it it does. Yeah. But this does. my my favorite line though in this entire movie is this next one. I, this is literally my favorite line. I could even quote it every day. <laughs> Bloody wolves chasing me through some blue inferno. Inferno. I just love the way he attacks that word. God, you know, watching it, I think that was a reshoot because his hair looks different. Uh-huh. It feels like they just shot him against the wall in L.A. and we're like, yeah, act out that thing. And like he's a little like rusty, I feel like that's must have been what happened there because his he looks totally different. And he does. He terrible. looks different, <laughs> and it, it sounds like he's channeling Bill and Ted like excellent oh. adventure at that moment. It's just oh. like I love that moment. That's my favorite line from this movie. <laughs> and you know what I I love about Keanu? Like I think his acting. I think he can be a really good actor, and I also think he can be a, not a great actor. But he's just he puts all it all in there, and he so gets cast, and I love him so much. And you know what? I appreciate it. And then him and Winona Ryder apparently got married in this movie, for real. But we can talk about that later. Did they really? Yeah, so there's the scene 
at the end where they are yeah. getting married after Jonathan survives and they're getting married. That was apparently an actual wedding ceremony and they got married. Talk about method. Yeah, seriously. So, but Paul, you get to a good point with like him seeming like kind of a goon, a silly, a kind of a silly goose, a guy who is just kind of like pretty to look at, but there isn't a lot going on. And then you have the innocent, like innocent looking Winona Ryder, meanest character who is contrasted to her friend, Lucy, um, who is like what fifteen or sixteen in the movie, but looks like she's twenty five. Like she's not is that even. What she's she like, is? she's oh like super young. I can't remember Jesus. how old she actually is, but there's like a couple. There's a moment where she says like how young she is, and it's a, like very wild. But we have the wild and free Lucy with the controlled and kind of meek Mina, and they're the best of friends, and they bring out like the best and the worst in each other. And we have these, like, these these typical relationships. They're very sweet. But then we get to the fucking castle. And then we see Gary Oldman as our old Gary Dracula. Oldman. With his booby hair that I just <laughs> want to grope. And it's just... this. And then I think, like, Coppola isn't fucking around with this movie. Like, we get this incredible shot before we get to the, the castle. I'm jumping ahead where we have Jonathan on the train. And we have the super impi- like we have the superimposition of the train, and then we have the map in the background, and like with the swelling score, and it fe- like because people know the story of Dracula, we know where he's going, like we know what's going to happen, and so instead of trying to be like, "Who we don't know if he's going," like what's happening, it's like very much setting up like he is going to somewhere incredibly dangerous, and we are it is going to be a wild ride. And he st- and Coppola still just makes it the most gorgeous thing. Just a train ride makes it absolutely like a cinematic experience. And it's just every time I watch this movie, I'm so impressed with like the visual aesthetic alone mm-hmm. that is created here and like the visual language of this movie. It's just so incredibly impressive with what I know. Creates. I got to shout out the shot where she commits suicide, where she jumps off the castle is like yes. just kind of the best one of the best shots ever that just doesn't get any credit whatsoever and like, i don't know why people don't aren't like showing this in film school like look at this shot right here um it's amazing it is amazing there there are a lot of gorgeous moments in this movie i love this encounter with dracula in the beginning and he's old and he's like his hair is just it's perfect. Like as I was watching this last night to prepare, I was like, Dracula is a drag queen. Like this is a drag performance right here with this, this, <laughs> this hair that he has that's down his back. He like flips out over the smallest of inconveniences. <laughs> he like delivers lines as if like he is tasting them. I love the, the moment. Well, first, I mean, there's, there's a couple things that are like classic lines. Like I never drink wine. Right. Mm-hmm. Or like, the creatures of the night, what what music they make, or mm-hmm. I love the line where he's like, "They say you are a man of good taste," and it's just like the way he like lingers on these lines are just it, it's it's perfect. He is so good in this movie. He's just like having such a good time. These just mm-hmm. can't be vampire, like a can't be. He's in that lo- ridiculous robe with the ridiculous train. Like everything about it is just opulent, and it's so funny because funny but it's like the contrast is wild because the entire castle is falling apart it's it's Mm. like the definition of like ruins of a castle but then you have this opulent old man who has long white hair and has this ridiculously bright red robe and is obviously like takes care in what he looks like and you have that contrast which is so fascinating and again like draws your eye to dracula and you can't stop looking at him even if he is you know, he's very old and he has the long nails and is meant to look maybe more monstrous. You cannot get your, you cannot take your eyes off of him. Like he is so like, all consuming, like pun intended. I guess my favorite version of Dracula in the movie. Oh, same. Like I don't love yeah. the young version as much. Like the old guy is like just so great. Everything he has impeccable style as a young man though. That's true. That's true. Those glasses are so <laughs> hipster, but so glorious. I love them so much. Those, what are they, blue or purple? Like, they just, they I have so much color little, to them. The perched on his nose kind of thing. Can I, can I mention the, uh, the most disturbing part for me, like, yeah. present day was in, with the old man. 
Keanu like takes his hands or something and there's like weird hair like coming out over yes. his, his things for like a split second. And I was like, that actually got to me. I was like, shit, my God. Like, I don't know why that's the moment now that scares me, but there's something really unnerving about the hairy top of hands. The old yeah. man hair is scary. Yeah. <laughs> It is, it is scary because it, it's like that kind of, I mean, he looks so unnatural in that beginning moment. But then when when you have like this very human touch moment and you look down and you are, it is tufts of hair. I mean, it, it's kind of foreshadowing the fact that he's a, also wolf, but it's like yeah. that moment is just like, what what just happened there? I can't imagine being Harker going to this man's house trying to be polite he gets like a sword put against his throat because he he makes a little joke and then he's holding his hands and there is wolf fur coming out of it. it's like <laughs> this is insane well and then we get the incredible shots here with the shadow the shadow play of the shadow my behind favorite. the one of my absolute favorite moments whatever i think about this movie is you know Jonathan is showing him the contracts on the desk and there's the candlelight. And then when he sees the photo of when Dracula sees the photo of Mina, who looks just like his Elizabeth from the beginning. I will say it like that all the time, by the way. (laughs) Um, Sorry about it. And you see his shadow start moving independently towards the photo and towards Jonathan. And, you know, this just sense of impending doom and impending kind of like danger that, you know, it's such a cool camera trick that yeah we've seen before but here it's just done so perfectly i feel like this is like the like the pinnacle of that kind of camera work and that kind of moment of terror of horror it's just oh god every detail about this movie is just done so meticulously well it's absolutely incredible and I do, I will say, as much as I love this movie, the first half, I think, is much stronger, in my opinion. I'm not sure how you, y- y'all feel about that. I just think that there are a lot more, like, s- deliberate aesthetic choices. I think there's a lot more dread building. I think the last half becomes more of an action movie as we have the group of guys, like, hunting him down. And obviously, you know, we get into more of, like, the the guys trying to fight the monster territory. But the first half is just this, like, gothic, gross sexy experience that I just like could live in which I agree the first half is perfect in its own way but I do feel like when Hopkins shows up like right in the middle like the movie goes to a place it kind of needs to where it's like okay Mm. we're gonna like it gets a second wind almost it gets a second wind where it's like okay we need someone like this at this point to really push it to the end and I feel like he's my favorite character in the whole thing he just like really makes me laugh like every line reading he has is like just amazing just like this is one i wrote down where it's like he's questioning keanu about the brides and he's like oh what what happened he's like trying to be like so innocent about it and uh keanu was like i was impotent with fear and then he's like i know like kind of being innocent like i know i know i know but just tell me about it and just like i don't know where that stuff's coming from but he just like takes the movie to a different place that I do appreciate. I think he brings the same energy that Gary Oldman is bringing to this performance. This sort of like, you know, we've seen Van Helsing so many times and he's bringing sort of like, I I mean, I don't want to say caricature, but there is a caricature of like the characters that we've seen up until that point of Van Helsing with his, his delicious da ya like (laughs) accent going on and just, an essence of camp that I think matches what Gary Oldman was bringing, particularly in the in the first part. And so I I completely agree that when he shows up again, it's like the film gets re-energized. It needed that because uh, those three suitors, as as hot as I would have thought they were growing up, they're Rocket they're really here. bland. They're so bland. I know, and we have we have Carrie Elwes as like the dashing Who's... the dashing British oh. gentleman. We have. Um, Richard Grant Jr., who we've seen um, in "Can You Ever Forgive Me," he plays the um, the doctor, the kind of creepy doctor who is addicted to opium and is also working at the institution where Renfield is being held. Renfield, played by Tom Waits, <laughs> didn't realize that till my most recent watching of this movie so that is Tom Waits. And then we have um, the American cowboy with his big knife. Um, all coming after our girl Lucy. Uh, I, okay, just real quick. The scene where they all come in and she greets them all is my absolute favorite because I just don't think that there are enough 
explicitly horny women in movies of this time period. I understand why a very different time sex was treated very differently, but she is just so openly like full of desire. And I understand that we can kind of see her being punished for that desire as the film progresses, as she is kind of targeted by Dracula and that kind of lustful behavior is punished, which is annoying, but I still love that her character is so full of life. And every time she sees one of her suitors come in, she's like, darling! And, like, gives them, and, like, goes up to them like, with the American guy. She's like, it's so big! And she pulls out a knife. It's just I know, so, it's so good. ridiculous, but it's just so good. It's just, like, Coppola knows what he's doing. He's like, I'm making a sex movie <laughs> with a story that we all are know know and love, but I'm going to imbue it with like a '90s grit that we don't that we didn't have obviously in the book and wouldn't have in maybe earlier adaptations of this. And so now it's going to give it that edge. And I absolutely love that. Lucy is my favorite character in this movie. As I've gotten older watching it, Lucy's my favorite. Her arc is tragic, and I it's and again, I think a lot of it does kind of speak to the punishment of loose women, women who have sexuality, but I still love the shit out of her. I think she's got some incredible parts, she's got some incredible outfits. I think that her death, I think, is incredible when she is decapitated in the um in her like her her like gla- there's a glass coffin, then she's decapitated, she's holding a baby and gonna eat it. In this incredible, like, looks like a clown costume almost, with like this <laughs> bonnet and giant collar. Like, it, again, it's campy. It's almost it's clownish, camp. but it's so, it's done so well that it doesn't feel like ridiculous. It feels appropriate. It feels necessary. And I love cool. that ability to take the camp, but make it feel not totally silly. I just think that's such an incredible, like, plus of this movie yeah. well and you're talking about lucy and, and the sexuality and i love that there is a sequence in here that is dripping with metaphor where it's almost a, it's almost like um a, an orgy with her where it's like all three of the men are giving her her blood and there's a the line afterwards that poor creature has had the blood of two men put in her already like it's like they just had sex and they're all so exhausted from from doing it and it's like this moment of just pure metaphor around this idea of blood and blood being life and blood being sexual and violence and all that well, kind of stuff it's just I, that sequence is so great and i mean like it's just the night it's 92 the aids crisis i mean the aids mm-hmm. crisis was still a huge thing and having the, again like i don't think there's a lot of, like to, to glean out of here about like an aids crisis metaphor but if you I mean, thinking about that in that age and having them talk about like having that sex and blood exchange metaphor is pretty pointed especially in 1992 like i think that is really interesting well, and Van Helsing even brings it up when he's having that discussion about vampire bats and talking about uh, syphilis, you know, that kind mm-hmm. of blood disease. Like, that is definitely at the forefront of here. And I do think vampirism, particularly coming out of the 80s, there was like a huge connection between um, vampires and queerness and also vampires and AIDS, particularly with like um, Lost Boys, Near Dark is another one that kind of employed the same like impure blood type aspect of it and to a lesser extent fright night as well so like coming out of that into this where it's like i i think he knew what he was doing in terms of that kind of metaphor yeah i mean i definitely remember aids in in school like being such a huge thing like there was they teach us all about it and like it was just such a huge topic and they'd show videos about it and people would come in it's like i have aids i'm going to talk to you about it and mm. nothing to be afraid of we're just gonna like it was just like everywhere like in the early 90s so. Everything I learned about AIDS from that time period was from 90210. There was an episode of 90210 about uh, someone <laughs> having AIDS, and he cuts himself in the kitchen. And Ooh. I forget which female character. She's like, it's okay. He's like, no, don't touch. And it's like, it's really it's, it's really bad. But like, yeah, that's all I knew about in terms of like AIDS growing up, which, <sighs> yeah. Media. Um, okay, so I do want to talk about the the cinematography in this movie too, because it is also quite stunning. I love the the there's this whole moment where we have like Lucy and Mina dancing in the rain, the camera spinning back and forth. We have like the Demeter kind of coming into to to land, the wolf escaping, the zoo, the e- there's like an Evil Dead almost camera shot of like mm-hmm. the just zor- zooming through like the the uh, London and up the steps to Lucy's room. It's like this this whole like sequence that ends up with the culmination of the the werewolf fucking. But it's like this this 
there's so much life in in this camera movement that that is through this entire movie. But that moment in particular, I was like, I love the way this whole thing is edited together to be just a cacophony of different things kind of all coming together. It's kind of surprising coming from Coppola because he's such like an austere, usually like the Godfather. Yeah. I don't, the camera barely moves at all in those movies. So it's really surprising, actually. Well, and it's like, it's dizzying. It's like you're drunk. It's like you're under the, you're under the influence of something, which again, I think that metaphor is coming in of like, oh, the, the Dracula's coming. Something is coming to London. Something, huh, coming. Sorry. Um, something is like influencing. <laughs> so, like we are under the influence of something and that something is terrifying, but also desirable because we have Lucy and Mina like almost falling over each other their clothes are clinging to their bodies it's it does feel again very sensual in the way that they're falling over each other and the way that like they're like water like you know they're wet and they you know we all associate with like, damn clothing clinging to women especially their breasts and it feel it does kind of and then again in the culmination of this storm with the sex scene it, it does amp up that kind of sensuality that sexual energy that electricity that has kind of, I think, been building to this point. And it, you know, sorry, explodes with this situation with, wow. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But I also think <laughs> something that's really interesting to me here, though, is we see these other forms, we're starting to see the more monstrous forms of Dracula, but how that monstrosity is also related to desirability, because we see him not just as an older man or as a young man, we see him as this wolf creature. And then we also see him throughout the film in other, like, other forms. And and again, we, you know, in Dracula lore, we know he can be a bat, he can be a wolf, he can be mist, he can take all these forms. But again, these forms are still desirable. Like, even when he is a monster, he is still, he is obviously engaging non-consensual sexual activity with Lucy. I think we can all agree that that is non-consensual sex happening with Lucy in the garden in her beautiful red robe that I want one. <laughs> but then we see her <laughs> later, I know, sorry, but in later in the film when he, when Dracula's in his like weird bat, bat monster states, we still have Mina as like Elizabeth, Elizabeth, like lusting over him and having and desiring him. So there is this really interesting creation of Dracula as desirable no matter what, which plays into that vampiric lore of the sensuality of vampires. But I think with the visual language that Coppola is creating, especially around the different forms that Dracula takes, it's like all encompassing. Like desire does not have to just be rooted in the physical appearance of somebody, but in their presence. And I think that's something that old like Gary Oldman does really well in terms of playing the character, but like I it have just crossed surprises. oceans of time <laughs> to find you. When I tell you that's the sexiest thing a man could ever say to me, like I would just be like, "All right, cool. Like you, I'm yours. I'm a monster. Like it, it doesn't matter. Like, <laughs> take me now. <laughs> take me now. Like it's over." <laughs> Sorry, husband in the other room, but like, well, <laughs> how attractive do you guys? <laughs> He cleared his throat very loudly and purposefully. How, how attractive do you find Oldman in this movie, just in general? So, okay. In, I, have, I, have, I have a pin set of him and Mina when he is at his hot, young, young form. Like, I have a pin set of the two of them on a blazer, because, obviously. But I think he is so hot in this movie. If that man came up to me and was like, hello, I'd be like, hi, <laughs> stranger danger, none, zero, <laughs> absolutely oh, none. But, like... Gary Oldman is a complicated figure in my head as an actor. He is not the best person. He has done a lot. He has committed a lot of like acts of domestic acts of domestic violence and everything. Just to acknowledge that. But in this movie, I've never found him hotter. Like he, I think has so much charisma. And I think, you know, obviously he looks incredible in the, the top hat, the, the glasses, the suit. I think that is all working toward him for him. But Again, the charisma and the presence he has, the way he speaks, the way he looks, the way he just, like, his whole face, like, he is so fucking horny for Mina. If any man looked at me like that, like, not, and not even in, like, a, like, piece of meat kind of way, but in, like, I have never been more obsessed with a person, and Gary Oldman captures that so perfectly in this movie. It's, like, oh my god jesus like i'm overwhelmed watching you like i'm not kidding it's really impressive when, wow. when he bursts yeah. from the crate 
just looking like hot sex. <laughs> I'm like, okay. I need to take a break. <laughs> <laughs> sweating, sweating so a little. Got the you, you're picking old men over Keanu when it comes down to it. Are you? Oh like, yeah, one hundred percent. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, Orlando. Okay. I'm keeping it at one hundred here. I would definitely do that. I'm sorry, Keanu. The the gray hair is very hot. I'm into that look. Oh, at the end. he was not doing it for me. I think it's <laughs> it looked like he was like spray like spray painted on. It looks so bad. I think he. <laughs> I just, I just oh, the presence that. Old men ha- like Dracula has <laughs> and Old Man has in this movie. It's overwhelming. Read horny. <laughs> How many times have you said horny? Oh my god. Right. So do you do you uh watch this movie a lot? Do you revisit it at all? <laughs> I'm sorry, that's just really asking Mary Beth, do you watch this movie a lot? <laughs> oh no, no, no. <laughs> no, stop. <laughs> No, but Paul, do you does this movie oh. revisit a lot, or is this a? Uh... It's it's one I YouTube a lot, where I'm okay. like, I think about the scene where Lucy gets killed in the crypt, like pre auctions. Mm. Like, let me just fire that one up because I feel like that's like the most rewatchable scene in the movie for me. So I feel like I YouTube it a lot, but it really was only like ten or so years ago that I really sat down and watched it again, like. After everything that happened, um, <laughs> right. I was like, "Oh, this is a great movie. This is just this is just a great movie." Um, yeah. What was the question? I think I answered. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just curious if you if this was one that you revisited a lot or not. It is now. It is now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's you know the other thing that I find so funny about watching this movie now is that one of my favorite and I talked about this on our episode where we uh, where I watched this like our little mini show that we do, but I watch Dracula Dead and loving it. The Mel Brooks <laughs> movie from the 90s, which is totally, you know, a parody of this movie. And so oh, you're right. I, every time every time I watch this movie, I immediately am quoting Dracula Dead and Loving It, <laughs> like particularly Lucy's death, where in here it is so it's so gothic. And I love I love the way it unfolds. But in Dracula Dead and Loving It, there's this. Have yeah. you seen it? Isn't that part where Stephen Weber gets all the blood on him? He's okay, like, yeah, know. staking it, and every time he does, it's like a geyser of blood is just uh, drenching yeah. him. <laughs> so that's what I think of every time I watch this movie. That and the earlier line of creatures of the night. What the mess they make because the bat is shitting down. It's just so it's it's hard to it's hard to watch this movie and not think about Dracula done loving it for me because that was the movie that I watched so much as a kid. Well, I guess as a teenager at that time, but like, yeah, so it, it's, it's weird watching this movie and not thinking of Mel Brooks. I love that that's one of your favorite movies and you just saw the actual Dram Stoker's Dracula I know. last year. It's just, I love uh-huh. it. It's incredible. Uh, I was going to say, I just wanted to, was wondering what you guys thought was sort of the current cultural footprint of the movie because when it came out, it was a hit and there was a lot of parodies of it. Like it had gotten into the culture. Like, I think The Simpsons did something on it, yeah. maybe. And mm-hmm. Mr. I mean, Burns Mel was, Brooks parody. Was him. So, yeah. So, like, but now I'm wondering, like, is this a forgotten movie? It seems like our generation has kind of rediscovered it a little bit, but I'm, I don't know. What, what's your take on where this movie sits right now? I think I, I, a lot of people in my sphere, like, horror people that aren't horror people specifically. So, my friend who was like, Do you want to watch Bram Stoker's Dracula with me and my newborn child? He's not a horror person, but he loves this movie. And I think because it's Coppola, I think it does still have power. And I think when people, when you talk especially about like erotic cinema, erotic horror cinema, I think people also talk about it. I don't, Hmm. I think it's not a, a movie I feel like comes up a lot in conversation, like organically online, but I do think a lot of people appreciate it for what it is, especially. And I think what, just from this is going from what I've seen on Twitter, what people actually have really seems to have stuck out is the costume design. I think that mm-hmm. is the big the big thing that still sticks out when this movie is discussed is um, the costume designer and the work that she did specifically. I think that is what is kind of in the conversation. Uh, I think, but I don't. I would still think it's. I still think it's pretty well regarded and discussed. Like 
relatively speaking. I mean, our listeners bullied me when they when I they found out that I had never seen it before. So I do think I don't think it comes up an awful lot, but I do think it's appreciated from what I've seen on like the online horror sphere. Mm-hmm. I would okay. say. Yeah. I think it's really different from a lot of the things we get today in like more yeah. contemporary because I think I know, it do is we like get erotic thrillers even like when's the last time well, was a hit? <laughs> so Terry and I said, not just but relatively again the last year did a whole series on our mini sods about erotic thrillers and like went through erotic thrillers from from the from the decades and we were talking about it like there aren't erotic thrillers don't really exist that much anymore like cinema actually feels much more sanitized than it was in like the 90s in terms of sexuality and sensuality like it is actually very strange to see how prudish cinema has become and Especially with, like, there isn't a lot of sensuality in horror. I I think that there are, but I think that this kind of combination of eroticism and terror isn't really that common, especially now. And, yeah, I think what this movie accomplishes, stealing your words, Terry, operatic, sumptuous, it's sensual, and I don't think that's really, like, that caught I don't. I haven't seen a movie that could really be compared to this. I don't think ever. Can we also briefly talk though about the special effects in this movie that are just next level? Considering that I, I did find like a quote, or not even a quote, but like a an article about how he um he did not want to use computer generated imagery. He did not mm-hmm. want to do. And he, mm-hmm. he wanted to use like antiquated effects, and so there's a lot of like optical or um on set amor- motions and camera th- cutaways and stuff but there are some really awesome moments in here i love and it's the moment that has stuck with me since i was a, a kid playing the the sega cd game is when he's a bat and he turns the cross on fire yeah, yeah he's just like he's oh, moving back yeah. and forth and the cross yeah. just bursts on flames it's so good or the moment when like he retreats into the shadows and then the light hits and he's just a pile oh, of rats that, turns into that the rats. collapse. Yeah, wow, it's that's so like, good. It's so flawless sometimes where it's just like there's barely any scenes. Like it's so convincing. I don't even think in the '90s people could have been aware that it was like old techniques. I think they would have been probably went over their heads. Really, like yeah, yeah, kind of crazy. I love the way the camp, like the 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 scene that I just. It's so subtle, but it's so good is when Harker gets picked up um, from the carriage and there's this man or something, you know, on the, on the, yeah, the carriage and he has like... That's never addressed again, by the way. The weird, like, ring wraith from fucking Lord of the Rings, like, <laughs> guiding With, like, the, the feather carriage. armor almost. But his arm goes out and it's, like, longer because the camera keeps panning and it just, it's longer than it ever has any right to be. And it just, like, takes his, shul- his shoulder and pulls him in. And it's such a, a subtle moment, but it's, like, there is something completely off with here. And then when we get to the castle, the castle doesn't obey laws of physics. Like, Dracula is able to climb, which, like, you know, you think, okay, he's a vampire. But then there's that scene where, where Harker's escaping and he's on the edge of the castle and his feet are moving. And he tries to go across the edge and all of a sudden... The edge is as if like he's falling down and it's such a disorienting, dizzying uh, display of like no gravity or how gravity is fucked up at this castle. It's so wild. Uh, I definitely want to try to rip some of this stuff off on the next movie. Like, okay, we got to go back to these techniques because it's just, they're just so perfect. I don't know. They're so good. Jesus. So like, I feel like we talk about this movie for six more hours, but... (laughs) Do we want to wrap, start wrapping up and give it a rating out of five? Is there anything else we want to touch on really quick? I know there's so much we could talk about, but, you know, do we feel comfortable moving towards wrapping up? Yes, but I, I am curious, Paul. Um, what did the your friend that you watched it with, what did what did he think? Did you guys ever talk about this movie again? <laughs> it never came up again, you know? Uh, I think we just sort of, one of those weird things you witness your friend doing and you just don't. Maybe just don't bring it up. Like, there was stuff I saw of him that was like, oh, you really got beat up there, didn't you? <laughs> but I'm not going to bring that up. Um, stuff like that. Uh, it's. Uh, I think he recognized that maybe it's best to not, not talk about that because I was a weirdo and I did a weird thing. <laughs> <laughs> did it affect you after watching the movie at all? Uh, like, after seeing it, other than the, the fear of your mom catching you? Other than the shame of... Running out of the room. I mean, that was probably the worst part. Just, just the shame. Just the deep shame. The shame. 
Yeah, I'm feeling uh, like I did something wrong. Feeling like I did, yeah. like, you know what I mean? And it's tough. I just want to be like, it's, there's nothing wrong. Just like enjoy the movie if you can. But at the time, it really felt like I'd done something wrong. And yeah, so I, I feel like I came to terms with it here, though. I feel like I've never really talked about it to anyone, really, or like definitely not in public, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> it's just us. There's no one else listening to this. It's yeah. okay. <laughs> I mean, when I submitted like, yeah, let's do Bram Stoker, as I was thinking about it last night, I was like, why am I going to say this on a podcast? This is a bad idea. <laughs> um, so I like, went Yay! Fine. Come join us <laughs> talking about pervy shit. <laughs> I was so excited when that email came in and it was the choice. Right. I was like, yes! Uh, the text okay. I got Pretty from good. Terry in all caps, Bram Stoker is Dracula. I was like, oh, it's the best day ever. And then I was, I was like, excited. I hope he's okay if we're a little horny about it. Because like, this movie is <laughs> this movie is incredibly erotic. It just yeah. is. Yeah. So. All right. Well, let's, let's wrap this sucker up and give this movie a rating out of five. Terry, how many werewolf fucks out of five? We picked this without knowing Paul's history with this movie. I'm so glad we went with it. So happy we did. It's so funny. I, five. I, I think this movie. I think this is a this is a perfect horror movie. Yes, maybe there's some issues in the middle part where it needs to like progress to the next stage, and then it does. But I just. I think this. Every time I watch this movie, I'm just wrapped up in its majesty, and I've only seen it like three times in the last year this is the third time i've watched it and every single time i'm just like this i could live in this world forever i do think it's funny though that um i, I was wondering as i was watching this because we just recently watched uh devil's advocate and i'm like what is it with keanu in the 90s picking movies that are erotic and are filled with bad accents because <laughs> we have this movie and that movie like six, what i think six years later that is Again, an incredibly erotic film that has some questionable accents in it. But yeah, I think you this movie is great. Worked, you know, you saw what worked. It, it, you know what? He leaned into it. And here's the thing. Yes, I, I, I would pick Gary Oldman over Keanu in this movie, but the, the Keanu in Devil's Advocate is... <laughs> okay, we're not talking about that, Terry. <laughs> <laughs> Keanu or Pacino, though. That's, that's oh, good. Pacino. Sorry. Oh, Pacino. <laughs> okay. Wow. Okay. Do Pacino, we have things there's... for older men? <laughs> <laughs> there's uh, <laughs> listeners go listen to our Devil's Advocate podcast because uh, <laughs> yeah that yeah anyway this movie's five it's gorgeous I love the effects I love the the performances I love the, the design of it I just I can't say anything else about it what about you Mary Beth do you give it one every werewolf fuck imaginable <laughs> um, five werewolf fucks for me this movie is like a ma is a fucking masterpiece literally and figuratively it is absolutely gorgeous I just I've every time I watch it I find something new to love about it I never get bored watching it and this is just a movie I'm so excited whenever someone is like I haven't seen it I'm like we have to watch it together and it's just like such a fun experience because I've shown I've now watched it with several people who aren't horror people who have watched it and been like, that was incredible. And I just, I love that it transcends that kind of genre label that might get people uh, nervous to watch it. And it, 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 it woos them with the beauty of what it's creating. And I think I, that's, I speaks to the power, not just of the story, but of Coppola's ability to tell the story and the, and the way that he chose to tell the story. And I think it's just like a damn near perfect movie for me. So this is a five. Werewolf fucks in a five. And then Paul, you have the final word. Whew, How many werewolf you know, fucks are you given this one? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, before I watched it again, I would have said five. Okay. But I feel like when I watched it last night, I think some of the love story stuff wasn't like totally clicking for me. Like that okay. big operatic yeah. love story. Like I found myself much less interested in that stuff. Um, so, like, I almost want to say 4.5 just because I saw a flaw, but I... Let's just do 5. Yeah, we'll do 5. <laughs> All right, cool. <laughs> yeah, five. Hell yeah. Six. There's a little caveat that maybe I don't love all the love story scenes. That's fair. It's That's still fair. great where it lands on, though. I love where it ends with a shot above, and then we cut to Coppola's title. Like, I love the last couple moments, though. So I feel like in the end, it really works for me, and that's why I'll give it a 5, but... I was a little like on the fence the whole time. Like, is this love story just too 
big and is it not mm-hmm. like down to earth enough? But let's do five. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Paul, for joining yeah. us to talk about Bram Stoker's Dracula. Cause so glad. It's so good. Uh, where can the listeners find you if you have an online space? And what do you have coming up? The floor is yours. What would you like to what, what do you have to share? Let's see. Uh, I think I just have an Instagram for uh, Landlocked. Uh, I think it's just like Landlocked underscore film. Uh, it's up there. Uh, it's coming out January 6th from dark sky you should be able to find it at you know the usual spots uh and then next uh there's gonna be a documentary about psychonauts 2 it's coming out i know you'll be excited about this um very soon so it's kind of like made concurrently with landlock so it's kind of like they're a little bit like sister movies in a way but uh oh yeah oh oh, so cool very different though very different (laughs) kinds of movies but uh so that's coming out soon really soon uh and then i'll be starting Right after Landlock comes out, I'm going to finish the script for the next one. So hopefully I can get the next one going soon. Yeah, and oh, yeah. stop being in this Landlock world. I'm ready to move on to something else. Jesus. Yeah. I bet. I can't that imagine. many years working on it. Uh, I mean, it's, it's got to be nice to have it out. It's weird to not work on it anymore. It's like, ah, I got a few ideas left. Hang on. Let me just take one more crack at it. Like, it's really like, I'm, sometimes it's like, yeah, just take it. But for this, it's like, ah, maybe I could shoot a little more. One more scene here, add that in, and, you know, but that's okay. I'm trying to let it go and not be too sad, so. Well, listeners, you have heard from us. We want to hear from you. What was your experience with Bram Stoker's Dracula? You can send us an email at scarredforlifepodcast at gmail.com, or you can reach out to us directly on Twitter. I am at MB McAndrews. And I'm at Dreadful. And, of course, don't forget to follow the podcast on Twitter at Scarred Podcast. And please don't forget to review, rate, and subscribe. And if you want to help support us, uh, sign up on Patreon. Thank you to Eric Power for our artwork. Thank you to Sean Keller for our music. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Please stay safe out there. But most importantly, stay creepy. And until next time. (laughs) 